One is, thank you, Doc, for letting the words touch your heart. It shows us that the Word of God is living and active, as the Bible says he is, and it is, and not just printed words on a piece of paper. And I appreciate that and was touched by it, and I hope the words of God always touch us as well. Secondly, I want to say, if you were here in the welcome, you heard me give a shout-out to uh, people who I'd received a text from, from Oklahoma City and Washington State this morning, and I... When as soon as I said that, my phone vibrated, and I had a text. It said, "What about a shout out to Tulsa, brother?" And so, to the Scots and the Cherries, I want to say um, thank you for watching. And we had a blast with you guys last week, and love you so much. And while I was saying that, I got a text from Georgia that says I'm watching too. So. I want to say to Greg McIntyre, um, thank you for tuning in, and I had a blast with you at the Braves game in Atlanta, like I did with Mike uh, as well. Now I've got to try to preach. She had every reason to be bitter, to go through life angry and mad at the world because of the hand that she had been dealt even though Beverly Seals had a magnificent voice, prestigious opera circles closed their door when she tried to enter, and she was repeatedly rejected for roles in which she was easily qualified. If you have ever been rejected, then you know it hurts, and you know how it stings, and you know how difficult it is to continue to keep trying and to keep pressing on, but she did. She went to Europe, and over time she finally won their hearts, which caused America to then begin noticing her and her tremendous soprano voice and her gifts and talents. But not only was her professional career an uphill battle, but her personal life was met by numerous challenges as well. She became a mother of two, was extremely excited to become a mother, and both of them had severe handicaps. Her daughter was deaf and had multiple sclerosis. Her son, Peter, was severely mentally challenged. But after she hit it big, she decided to escape the fast lane of New York City. And so she spent her career earnings and bought a house on the affluent island known as Martha's Vineyard. Two days before she was to move in with her family, that house that she purchased burned. Let her difficulties sink in. Her heart was ripe for the seeds of bitterness to take root, wouldn't you say? And yet she would not give the enemy a foothold. In the book, The Applause of Heaven, the author said, and I quote, her friends didn't call her bitter, they called her Bubbles. Because of her joyful countenance and her attitude and the, fa and the fact that her face was one of peace. She didn't minimize the hurt and the difficulties of the pain. That's reality. But she chose to respond differently. That's the question I want to ask you this morning. How could a person endure the sting of numerous rejections and endure on a daily basis a number of traumatic events and still be known as a person of joy? Here's how she answered the question before she died. She said, years ago, I knew I had little or no choice about my success 
my circumstances, or even my happiness. But I knew that I could choose to be cheerful, so I simply chose to be cheerful. Now I'll ask you if that moves you like it does me. I want to commend those of you who are here this morning who, like Beverly Seals, have been dealt some extremely tough hands in your life, but you have courageously chosen to make the same choice. In order to keep your sanity, to continue to serve, and to continue to be a blessing to others. And you are. In no way does that choice minimize the hurt and the pain. It just allows you to function on a higher plane. It allows you to continue to connect with Jesus and be a blessing to us. So thank you for choosing life. On the other hand, if you're here this morning and you are struggling to make that choice because of some serious stuff you're having to deal with, I too want you to know that's understandable. But I hope that Beverly Hill Seals' story will help you find the courage to make that same choice. And I hope that what you hear from those who went to Antigua and saw the joy-filled lives of children who have anger underneath the surface because of the hands that they were dealt, but now are making choices to choose to rise above it because of what they've heard about Jesus and what they've seen about Jesus from people who are willing to go from the Cross Point Church. I hope those stories will inspire and encourage you to make that choice. If you didn't sign up for the Pray for Antigua, and if you hadn't heard or read some of those posts, you ought to go back and do that. Go back and read Sister Hannah Faust's blog that will grab your heart. I sat there at my computer and cried listening to her heart that beats loudly for those precious children. Read what Sister Scarlett Thompson, Sister Tara Glover wrote and see if your perspective won't be broadened. One wrote, there was nothing vacation about it except a vacation from pride and comfort and we need vacations from that. Isn't that true? Here's a story that Scarlett told. She told, gives the name of a boy I know I'd mispronounce if I said it. He lives behind the Villa Church and attends there with his siblings, but his parents aren't Christians. Bernard, the preacher there, has invested in him and has a similar story of his childhood. And I'll pause here and say that Bernard was a little boy there when Dorian and Sherry lived there. And Dorian took him under his wing and mentored him, and now he's the preacher there at Villa. Isn't that wonderful? And she's telling now about the preacher, that boy, that preacher, now taking another boy who lives behind the building and trying to do the same. She said he's experienced quite a bit of spiritual warfare this week. He got in a fight with some boys who had him in a headlock and ripped his earring out because he was going to church in the evening. Now just think about that for a moment in light of the lack of persecution that most of us have in coming here week to week. He's been called names. His friends, and that's in quote, today discouraged him from being baptized. And he had changed his mind at one point due to the persecution he faced. The good news is he decided today to give his life to Christ and another Villa boy was beside him the whole way and said he would support him and encourage him. That boy was baptized last year. Isn't that wonderful? Still living it out, still reaching out, making disciples and encouraging others. And that encourages me. Tara wrote, I want to share one special baptism with you. It was amazing. And no words can describe the emotions I felt. This young lady was born with an abnormality. I'm thinking maybe clubfoot. So she's always been in a wheelchair. She's been attending VBS and also church at Villa. Today, she decided to be baptized along with several others. After a long day, we went down to the beach to witness these life-changing decisions. As I was standing along the shore, I turned around 
And here she came crawling toward the water. Ah, oh, man, she said. She was so excited. Her friends met her along the shoreline, and they were so excited. After her baptism, she started crawling back up and became fatigued, so a couple of our crosspoint peeps helped her back into her wheelchair. Another seed has been planted, and it will continue to grow. And isn't that wonderful, again, because we rejoice with kingdom people all over the world. I'm grateful for the choices that so many of you have made and are making to be disciples who make disciples. And I pray that God will continue to bless all of us as we strive to make choices that please Him. Let's open our Bibles together this morning to where we left our study a few weeks ago, which was at the end of Matthew chapter 5. As we've done several times in this series, let's imagine that we are a first century Jew who's curious about the one who's claiming to be the long-awaited Messiah sent from God to liberate us. So sitting on the mountainside, we're listening to him lay out how life as his disciple is to be in the kingdom. And let's suppose that we're trying to decide whether or not we're going to join him in this movement. It would have been very easy for us to be sitting on that mountainside and be very bitter and angry about the hand that we've been dealt. After all, most of the people who were sitting there were poor. They were poor peasants, like Mary and Joseph. So let's imagine that all of us are poor, trying to just make ends meet. And our land has been inhabited by the hated pagans, the Romans. And they're laying heavy burdens on us. They're taxing us, and taxing us, and taxing us. And not only do we struggle to pay our taxes, but now we're having to pay them to a foreign government. And in addition to that, we really know that we're God's chosen people. But somehow what we've seen in religion hadn't really turned us on. There are 6,000, according to Josephus, Pharisees, who have a holier-than-thou attitude. And while we admire their knowledge of Scripture... We know from Matthew 23 and from our own personal experiences that they don't practice what they preach and they're binding heavy burdens on us that we don't want any part of that. And there are some 20,000, according to Josephus, priests and Levites around us who are supposed to be helping us connect with God. But we know from Luke chapter 10, if we were hurting on the side of the road, much less if an outsider was, would they stop and help us? They'd pass by on the other side. And we want no part of that. And we've looked at the Sadducees. And most of their followers are the wealthy and well-to-do, which it's, that's okay. But whenever we've gotten closer... To them, all they want to do is debate whether or not there is a resurrection. And we don't want any of them. So we've looked at the zealots and we admire their passion. But we are concerned that their interpretations of Scripture has been turned into a political agenda that's based on this premise we must overthrow the evil empire and we will at all cost and if you don't agree with us and you don't collaborate with us and you don't cooperate with us we'll kill you and we've decided we want no part of that and we've looked even at the Essenes, and we've thought maybe there'd be something to that. After all, they're the people who said, we can't live in this kind of culture anymore, and we'll just chunk it. And they have, 
and they've got everybody who's like-minded, and we've gone up to, they've gone up to the mountain of Masada, and they just live with people who think just like they do. And boy, that'd be appealing, wouldn't it? There's only one problem, we can't be salt and light that way. So here we are on the mountainside, and we're listening to Jesus, and he's going to lay out for us, this is what life has got to be like in my kingdom, if you want to come and follow me. And he is amazing and stunning us by what he said. And we know that by Matthew's editorial comment at the end of the sermon, in chapter 7. So like we've studied in this series, Jesus has laid out, if you want to be blessed, then there are eight attitudes that you need to have in your life. God will truly bless those who humble themselves and mourn over their sinfulness and the heartbreaking condition of others. And God will truly bless the meek. Not the weak, but he'll bless those who have their strength under his control. And he'll bless those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And he'll fill them up. He'll bless those who show mercy to other people. He'll bless those who are peacemakers. Not the peacekeepers, but those who genu genuinely make peace. He says if you'll live that way, not only will you be blessed in the here and now, but you'll have a great blessing and great reward in heaven. But he wants to make sure we understand that if we live this way counterculturally, from the way most people live, that we'll be insulted and persecuted. And people will talk about us. And they'll say all kind of evil things against us. And so he's going to go a step further. And he's going to tell us how we're to respond to that. And so I want us to continue with this series today by picking up our study in verse 21. And before I read this text, I want to say this. It brings us now to this challenging part of the sermon where six times Jesus says, you've heard it said, You've heard it said of old, but I'm going to say to you. Years ago, when I was a young preacher in Georgia, I went to Dalton, Georgia, to hear a well-known brotherhood preacher preaching a gospel meeting. The meeting was advertised as a series of lessons from the Sermon on the Mount, and particularly... The advertisement was that this preacher was going to deal with these six sayings. The six times in the sermon that Jesus said, You've heard it said, but I'm saying to you. So I went eagerly excited about it. I took my notebook like I did and like many of you do and a pen. And I sat there ready for the lesson. And this well-known preacher gets up and he says six times, in this sermon, Jesus says, You've heard it said, but I say to you. And this is what he did. He took that phrase, he used it as his hook line, and he talked about six things that he believed was threatening the church today. And he didn't talk one about what Jesus said of the six things Jesus said. And I was so disappointed... Not because of what he said might not have been true, but I want you to know why I was disappointed, and that was this. I had come to hear what Jesus said. If Jesus said, you've heard it said, but I say to you, it behooves us to listen to what Jesus says, doesn't it? And so that's what I want us to do this morning. I want us to listen to what Jesus said. We'll read the first one and talk about it. You've heard it said, verse 21, to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who's angry with a brother or sister will be 
subject to the judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, and here's an Aramaic term, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fires of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taken you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way. Or your adversary may hand you over to the judge. And the judge may hand you over to the officer. And you may be thrown in prison. Truly I tell you, you'll not get out until you've paid the last penny. When Jesus said, you've heard it said, you shall not murder, he was referring to the sixth command that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai in the code of ethics, that God wanted his people whom he had brought out of Egypt and liberated and brought to himself to live by. There on Mount Sinai, God wrote in stone, how he wanted his people to have a close relationship with him and a close relationship with each other, with other people. And so one of the commands, the sixth one, was you don't take anybody's life. And in Numbers 35, he said, whoever murders somebody is in danger of the judgment. But then in Numbers 35... God sets out six cities of refuge where anybody who has violated the law and has actually murdered somebody and taken their life can go and still live and try to turn their life around. Which is what the gospel's about, by the way, isn't it? It's all of us who have sinned is trying to find refuge and peace and continue to receive the mercy and grace and forgiveness that God's offering to all of us who fall short constantly of the glory of God. Why would God give a command, write it in stone, thou shalt not kill? It's because of this. Life is precious. Every life is precious. The life that beats inside a mother's womb that we call unborn is precious. Our children are precious. Handicapped children are precious. Our teens who have all kinds of struggles right now going on in their lives, they're precious. University students, young professionals, trying to figure it all out, they're precious. Singles are precious, whatever the reason. Our elderly, people that are here in wheelchairs today, they're precious. Life is precious because every life was created by God and we are created as living souls. Life is precious to God and life must be precious to those of us who are kingdom people. So let's envision that we're sitting on that mountain. And we hear Jesus say, verse 21, You've heard it said of old, Thou shalt not kill. And we've got a Pharisee who's sitting beside us and he says, Preach on, Jesus. That's good, brother. You're right true to the text and the commands. And he's hollering, Preach on. Why? Because he doesn't have any, any hint in his mind at all that he would ever take anybody's life. And he wouldn't. And we wouldn't either. But listen closely, Jesus is not just concerned about what we don't do. Jesus is also concerned not about what we're against, but what we're for. He's also concerned not only about what we don't do, but about our hearts and the motives behind what we do. And how we deal with whatever has been put before us and is on our plate. So when we come to verse 22, none of us are off the hook. Because one of the issues 
that kingdom-minded disciples of Jesus have to personally address is anger. And I guarantee you, in a crowd this size, there are a lot of us who have layers and layers of built-up frustration and anger that's simmering inside us. And if it is not confessed and addressed and dealt with and processed, there'll be an eruption or explosion, and I'll tell you what will happen. People will get hurt. That's what will happen. Because words we all know can hurt us, can't they? They sting, they hurt, and they can hang with us for a long, long time. So let me just jump in and deal with this very quickly, and then we'll go to how Jesus wrapped it up. Biblically, anger is not necessarily a sin. Make sure you understand that. In the Old Testament, the anger of the Lord is mentioned 18 times. And in the New Testament, we have examples of Jesus being angry with righteous indignation. I'll mention two. One is in Mark chapter 3, when Jesus was confronted by some hard-headed Pharisees who were looking for reasons to accuse him and were looking closely to see if he was going to help somebody and heal them on the Sabbath day. Now let me ask you, is your vote on the fact he healed that man with a shriveled hand or not? Yes, he did. And when he did, Mark 3 verse 5 says, Jesus looked around at those hard-hearted Pharisees and he was angry with them. He was angry with them, with the hardness of their heart. And many of us know the stories of Jesus turning over the money changers, the tables there that they had because they were sticking it to the poor who were coming to praise God and to pray to God in his Father's house of prayer. There is legitimate reasons to be angry. There are legitimate, legitimate reasons to be angry. And righteous indignation is appropriate. But anger can certainly cross that line and become sin. It robs us of our joy. It hinders our testimony. It damages our relationships. And that's why we have to put safeguards in place to process it and deal with it. Otherwise, as Ephesians 4.27 says, it gives the devil a foothold. If we give him an inch, he'll take a mile. Psychologists teach that behind most anger is one of four things. Let me share them with you. Somebody's either hurt you, or you're hurting, and there's, or there is resentment about the hand you've been dealt, something that's going on, something that somebody won't do, something that they have done, sometimes they won't get it, whatever that is, but there's resentment that's set in. Thirdly, there's frustration that's there. Feeling blocked or stopped and not knowing what to do, can't get this situation to change, to go away, don't know how to deal with it, don't know what to do. Or, fourthly, there's some kind of fear that's driving this anger. When anger freezes, it comes into, turns into depression. And a lot of people live that way. And I don't believe it's a sin. Elijah was depressed, but I believe it has to be dealt with. On the other hand, what happens a lot of times is people just, vi just, uh, just let it build to the fact there's an eruption. And there's some kind of angry outburst. And William Harley in his book, Love Busters, which is one of the sessions I share in premarital counseling with couples who are about to get married, Harley says that angry outbursts are six of the things that can puncture holes in people's love tanks and can really drive wedges in relationships. It's when we verbally blast somebody or insist on selfish demands or have disrespectful judgments or some kind of even 
uh, independent behavior where we're not willing to work together. I say that to tell you a story of how I know those things are true. I had just taught that unit years ago in, um, to seniors in the public school in Georgia when uh, the school counselor came to my room and asked me if I'd make a home visit to go see uh, a student who hadn't been to school in three or four days, um, play ball for us, and she just asked would I go. I went to his house, went in his room, it was very obvious he was depressed, middle of the afternoon, still in bed, and I shared those things with him. I asked him if he thought he was depressed, he wouldn't respond, I shared those four things there. I asked, is there anything that's happened recently that's really hurt you? And is there any resentment over it in your life? And do you feel frustrated about what's happened? And he said, I said, is there any one of those four in your life right now? And guess what he said? Anybody want to guess? All four of them. I said, can you tell me about it? And it was just like the spillways opened up. He just started talking, and he told me his story, and I understand why he felt that way. One of which he loved uh, the sport that um, he wanted to play, and he'd been cut from it. And if you've ever been cut from a cheerleading squad, a ball squad, or anything, or said you're not wanted, you know how tough it is. We talked. He talked. He shared all of those things with me. We developed a plan of action to try to get through those things. And when we finished, I said, so what do you think you're going to do in the morning? He said, I think I'll go back to school. And I took from that several things. I took that he needed to talk. I took that he needed somebody to understand that what had happened to him really hurt him, was, re was real. He was crying out. Nobody was listening. It had frozen. And I think he needed a plan of action to know that his life wasn't coming to an end that he could move forward. And I'm grateful for that. Now let's go back to the text and let's take it like Jesus did. Because I do not want to be guilty of, of doing what that preacher long ago did. Jesus is talking about a disciple who's angry with whom? A brother or a sister. Isn't that what the text says? And that anger has led to unkind remarks and insults that have resulted in derogatory terms, again, in this text that we don't use today. But if we insult somebody and call them a fool or moron, or like Archie Bunker said, and I know it was in jest to his son-in-law, but you remember what he called him? Meathead, and why did he, he said? Because he was dead from the neck up. Jesus says that when we talk like that, we're in danger of the court. Isn't that what he says? We're in danger of the court, of standing before the court. We're in danger of the judgment. And so I would rather practice the admonitions of what our Lord's brother said in one of the earliest written New Testament letters. And that is this, let every man be slow to what? Speak. And slow to anger and quick to what? Hear. Uh, it takes a lot of self-control to do that. But that's the plane that Jesus is calling his disciples to think about here on this mountain. Because he's not just concerned about taking somebody's life. He's concerned about our words imparting life. And when James even talks about that little two-ounce membrane in our in our mouths, in chapter 3, he says, isn't it amazing that out of the same mouth can come out praise and cursing? 
And then do you remember what he said? My brethren, it ought not to be that way. It's a challenging, challenging point to all of us who are striving to be salt and light. So let me be crystal clear this morning. Are there times when anger is justified? Absolutely. And what happens when it boils within us? We must process it appropriately. We must determine the source that's driving it behind us. We need to pray. If it's unjustified, we confess it to God. We go and make things right. And if it's justified, we still practice self-control in what we say and what we do. So let's go one step further. When is it unjustified? Scripturally, I can tell you a few times, it's unjustified when it comes up from the wrong motive, like it did in the, prodigal, in the older prodigal son. Do you remember that story? You do, don't you? Younger son messes up royally, wastes all of the, his father's money. Obviously, I believe he sins, sins multiple times. But when he comes home, what's the response of the father? You're welcome home. And the text says, when the older brother saw all of the rejoicing in the father's house, he became, you fill in the blank, what? Angry. He became angry. You mean to tell me that some people will become angry over whom God blesses? You mean to tell me some people will become angry over whom God chooses to extend his favor upon? Yeah, sadly, yeah. Secondly, I believe it's unjustified when things don't go our way. We're called to handle it much differently. But Jonah didn't. Same scenario when that evil city of Nineveh repented and those barbaric people actually got on their knees to the Je Jehovah God and acknowledged their sins before him. God relented from the calamity he was going to send to them and the text says Jonah sat down and became what? Angry. That God would forgive those people. Amazing to me. It's also unjustified whenever we react without knowing the facts. And that happens frequently. I believe the words of the old song are true. Please walk a mile in my shoes. Before you abuse, criticize, and accuse, please walk a mile in my shoes. You see, here's the point of the lesson today. This lesson was such an important issue to Jesus that he looks at his disciples on that mountainside in trying to train them how to be a disciple. And this is what he said. Repairing a relationship with a brother or sister who has something against us is more important than the monetary gift that you've chosen to come and bring and give to God at the altar today. Now you let that sink in for just a moment. Jesus knows that our relationships are vitally important to the growth of the kingdom, to our own spiritual life and health. And that's why of those Ten Commandments, they start with the vertical one between us and God and getting our heart there, and it extends to the same treatment that God has given to us and how we respect other people. So here's the lesson this morning. Kingdom-minded disciples respect people because they're made in the image of God. Kingdom-minded disciples value friendships, and they value people. They value relationships. And kingdom-minded disciples nurture those. And we guard with people who don't always act like we want to, but we're working on guarding our hearts and practicing self-control, which is a fruit of the Spirit, and whenever we know and remember that our brother or sister has something against us, we're called to make the first step, aren't we? We're called to be the ones who go and do it, and then come back and give our praise and our money and our offerings here. We forgive, 
And that's the key issue because God through Christ has forgiven us. I don't know what lesson you thought you would hear today when you came. Since it's the next one in the text, I felt it needed to be preached. And I pray that the invitation of Jesus that extended, that is now extended to all of us is an invitation for us to come to Him just as we are. Without any plea, without any excuse, without anything, we just come. Maybe you come wanting to follow Bonnie's example and be baptized into Christ, or maybe you come bringing issues that are simmering below the surface that you need the prayers of of the, your brothers and sisters here and you need the mercy and grace of God to help you find peace and refuge. I, I don't know what your response might need to be, but we're going to sing that old familiar song. We're not going to sing a hundred verses of it like we used to in the past, but we're going to sing it. And if you need to come, we encourage you too as together we stand and sing.